We're going to take a look at the, uh, some of the issues that counselors deal with and uh, the goals of counseling. Basically, we're going to start with this from Gary Collins' perspective. Uh, according to Gary Collins, in his book, Christian Counseling, the Bible contains many examples of human needs. Uh, its pages tell about anxiety, loneliness, discouragement, doubt, grief, sadness, violence, abnormal sex, bitterness, poverty, greed, sickness, interpersonal tension, and a variety of other personal problems, sometimes uh, seen in the lives of the greatest saints. Job, for example, was a godly man, famous, wealthy, and highly respected by his contemporary. Then things suddenly fell apart. He lost his wealth and his, his health. His children all died in a tornado, plunging him into intense grief and despair. Instead of giving support, his wife preferred to nag and complain. His three friends offered a little help, and God must have seemed far away. And this is a good example of, of someone who has multiple crises happening in one day. Uh, and that has happened. That has happened to me, in all honesty. One crisis after another. Uh, and I've heard persons who've uh, uh, said, for goodness sakes, this is just not my day. You know, everything seems to be happening one after another. Uh, and that's why many times when I, I start my day I, with prayer and, and the Word of God, I say, well, God, nothing's going to happen today that you can't handle. And it's going about my business. Uh, uh, then along came Elihu. He was a young man who listened to Job and heard his struggles. Elihu was critical of those well-meaning but insistent counselors who had lectured Job and given advice in their attempts to be helpful. In contrast, Elihu showed acceptance and concern, a humble willingness to be on the same level as Job without an holier than thou attitude, a courage to confront and an unswerving desire to front the counseling to God, who alone is sovereign and able to help in time of need. Elihu was one counselor who succeeded where others had failed. There's many times we're going through the turmoils of life, the agonizing of, of uh, uh, many um, critical and hurting situations. It's good to have somebody who would listen without being critical, uh, who will uh, accept, is just, uh, just accepting you, uh, just out of love and just saying, I'm here for you. I'm walking alongside you. What I can do to help, let me know. Uh, that's such a relief to have a person of that nature uh, to do that. Uh, some persons might even start to asking. You might find yourself having a lot of uh, crisis coming about in your life, a lot of things happening. Uh, some persons would ask the question, well, what did you do? for all this to start to happening. Uh, you must have done something wrong. And here we go, being critical. Uh, not being helpful at all. Uh, being judgmental. And definitely you don't need to be that kind of counselor at all. Uh, if someone came to you and said, well, you know, my husband is really uh, angry with me and he has threatened to walk out on me. Uh, please don't ask them, what did you do for your husband to become angry and threaten to walk out on you? Don't ask that question, please. Uh, and just listen. Let them tell me, you know, let them tell you where it hurts. You know, let them explain to you how they're feeling and how it's impacting them. And so, therefore, you definitely want to really... Uh, uh, and then take the, and, and then your posture sometimes. Uh, people who are hurting uh, many times can become very vigilant in terms of watching every gesture that might be a sign to them that you are not really, uh, you don't want to be bothered with them. I mean, it might be a sign to them that you feel that you're better than they are. Uh, and uh, so they're watching a lot of things uh, that might come from you as that counselor. And so, therefore, be aware that if you find yourself uh, sitting at a distance away from the person, uh, 
where the person is kind of isolated and, and there's no kind of warmth or leaning forward or showing any kind of concern uh, that might imply to the person that you have a holier than thou attitude toward them. And that can be very discouraging. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you definitely want to uh, do as Ella who did in terms of Job. Uh, Gary Collins further states that several years ago, a former president of the American Psychological Association estimated that every, that even today, three out of four counselors are ineffective. And it's probably even more so now, uh, since that time. This is now uh, the 21st century. Uh, he was speaking within the 20th century time of, uh, of this. Recent re research has shown that most pastors feel unprepared for their counsel responsibilities and most are not very competent as counselors. Some evidence suggests that the majority of counselors are ineffective and perhaps even harmful. And that's something to have heads up about. Uh, but in my ideal is that when you subject yourself to the uh, great counselor, to the Holy Spirit, to the Lord God Almighty, God will give you uh, um, not only the tools through your studies, uh, but he'll give you uh, the, the power to really be a, a, a bomb in helping others who are hurting. Others do not succeed, however, they counsel very effectively. There are some persons that have uh, done some very effective counseling, where it might be, but nothing has happened. Uh, uh, and, uh, but those persons who have counseled effectively have something that's very interesting in terms of their personalities. They're persons who uh, radiate sincerity. You know, you just know, you have a feel from these persons that, that they are sincere in their treatment of you. You know, the counselee has that feeling that that counsel, that past is very sincere. Um, also, uh, they have a feeling that the persons, uh, that pastor, that counselor is understanding them. Because there's certain things that they can feel the sincerity, they can feel the, the they get the feedback from that, that pastor or that Christian counselor that really is is uh, telling the counselee that hey, they are with me, they really are understanding me. Uh, compassion is very important uh, uh, in terms of the person saying you know they really are showing compassion for me. You know, uh, I'm certain that even when the lady that was caught in adultery and the persons were willing, according to the, the law, to stone this lady, Jesus showed compassion. He showed compassion uh, toward this lady. And when all the accusers walked away, uh, he instructed, uh, you know, you're where your accusers. Uh, then Jesus said, hey, I don't accuse you, go and sin no more. But he went and said, go and sin no more. But he showed compassion for the lady. I wonder sometimes in our society, the way it's happen, happening now, it was our Christian uh, 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 communities, uh, if that was presented to them in terms of he who is without sin cast the first stone. Uh, I'm wondering, within our Christian community, would somebody start picking up some stones and casting them? This tells us that something has happened within our Christian community that needs some attending to. Uh, also, uh, there are persons, or a certain personality, that's when the counsel is they deal with the counselee, uh, they can uh, present a confront, but do it in a very loving, genuine, and constructive way. Uh, it's not what you say many times, but it's how you say it uh, uh, that would have certain kind of impacts on the, on, on, on the counselee. You know. uh, and so therefore, I always know that there's a time for what we call confrontation. 
uh, and at the initial session, counseling session, that is not the time for confrontation. No, no. Uh, that's the time to listen, to pay attention, to hear what the person is saying, uh, to really uh, get a sense that you know that they can trust and to get a sense they can trust and so forth and so on. You know, that's the time to kind of find out what the problem might be, what you might be doing in terms of work with the person. But it's not a time to jump on that person's case and start to confront them. Confrontation comes down the line, especially when you have built up. Uh, since the person build up with you a sense of rapport, a trust, that they can trust you. Uh, and they know that you are uh, definitely looking and working with them in terms of what is best for them. Uh, and they know that even when the time comes, that you might talk with them about needing to follow through with certain things, they know that you're doing it for their best interest. And so, therefore, they can definitely uh, embrace it and take it in as such. Uh, so, but there's a time for uh, confrontation. Uh, now, the goals of counseling. Why do people come for counseling? What do they want to accomplish? What is your reason for trying to help with their counseling problems? These are difficult questions. Each can have a variety of answers depending on both the counselee and the counselor. Christian counselors might expect their clients to bring problems concerning prayer, doubt, doctrine, spiritual growth, or guilt over sinful behavior. However, according to the Collins, one survey found, however, that only 10% of pastoral counseling deals with religious issues such as these. More often, people came with marriage, tension, crisis, depression, interpersonal conflicts, confusion, and other problems in living. And that's what I found myself in terms of persons coming to me many times. Uh, and in the process of these different problems in terms of interpersonal relationships or marriage or tension or crisis, what it might be, um, they have start to bring up issues in terms of their questioning about the relationship with God a God relationship with them uh, these start to coming up later on but many times uh, they just don't come in with just directly with that many times uh, and so but we know that and we'll, we'll be saying this over and over at the core of all problems that persons might have having these spiritual issues at the core. Uh, uh, Jesus was concerned about these kinds of problems. He stated that he had come to give life in abundance and all its fullness. And what is surely the most famous verse in Scripture, Jesus had told God's purpose in sending his Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus therefore had two goals for individuals, abundant life on earth and eternal life in heaven. Now, these are the interpretations according to Gary Collins. Makes sense to me. Uh, uh, the counselor who follows Jesus Christ has the same ultimate goal of showing people how to have abundant lives, of praying individuals uh, to the eternal life that is promised to believers. If we take the Great Commission seriously, we will have a strong desire to see all our counselors become disciples of Jesus Christ. If we take the words of Jesus seriously, we are likely to reach the conclusion that a fully abundant life only comes to those who seek to live in accordance with his teaching. And one of the things I want you to give some serious cons consideration to, and I want you to think about it in the process of your, your walk with the Lord or, or the Lord Jesus Christ, think about uh, uh, when the college had mentioned uh, that fully abundant life only comes to those who seek to live in accordance with his teaching. Think about uh, and mull over uh, the, the question of uh, do I have a covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? That's something that I think that all of us as Christians 
You know, all of us who've committed our lives to Christ and accepted the Lord, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, need to think about am I in or do I have a covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? The Word of God tells us whether we do or not, but we need to think about it many times. It is well known that there are many sincere Christians who will have eternal life in heaven but who are not experiencing their abundant life on earth. These people need counseling that involves something other than evangelism or traditional Christian education. Uh, and Collins, just for word for word, such counseling, for example, might have counsel recognize hitting harmful attitudes. And that's something you need to think about. Many persons, even including ourselves, and that's why you need to really look in terms of who am I? Oh, we can use many statements in terms of, of you know, I'm a child of the Lord and this and that and so forth and so on. You know, but you need to really get down to just who am I? Uh, and that's when uh, Jesus posed after it heard to the, about who the people say that I am. But he posed the question to his disciples, but who do you say I am? And Peter said that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Peter. But it's getting at the core of something that we need to really think about. You know, who am I? And there are a lot of persons who really are having uh, uh, problems in certain areas because they carry with them some harmful attitudes in terms of who they really are, in spite of being Christians. And many times these harmful attitudes, as you'll find in some more advanced courses, that uh, they can come from your family system. Some of them. Uh, also, persons might uh, need to be taught interpersonal skills and new behaviors. There are persons who, uh, for some reason or another, do not know how to really interact in an appropriate way with other people. Uh, and uh, there are some persons, uh, they might have good intentions, they might be very intelligent, what it might be, but they're very blunt and very hurtful and when it comes down to relating to other persons. And there are some persons who need to really look in terms of uh, new behaviors. When we become new creatures in Christ, we need to look in terms of new behaviors. Mm -hmm. and those are... Uh, who need some guidance and, and uh, uh, making decisions or changing their lifestyles or how to mobilize one inner resource to cope with the crisis and that's something that a lot of pastors are going to find themselves dealing with a lot of uh, crisis situations crisis situations uh, and that's why I always encourage persons to take the course Introduction to Crisis Counseling. All persons, because uh, Howard Stone's book uh, on crisis counseling is very informative, uh, especially for pastors or persons who are in the ministry, uh, because persons definitely need to know how to mobilize inner, their, their inner resources in terms of dealing with crisis. At times, such counsel guided by the Holy Spirit can free a counseling from persistent, uh, Collins call hang up, hang ups of past memories. A lot of people are stuck in the past. A lot of people are not able to move beyond what has happened to them in the past. Uh, I was talking with a person uh, today, and uh, it related a past experience to me uh, that was very hurtful. And they said that, well, uh, my friend asked me whether I could forgive that person. And, of course, the individual said, well, no, I can't forgive that person. But then they said, then, then the individual said, well, I can forgive them, for, but I cannot forget. Uh, well, have you genuinely forgiven? Because Psalm 103 tells us that 
when God forgives us, he cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. The word of God tells us he's cast our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. And so therefore, this person is having a hard time here. And having a hard time because uh, genuine forgiveness has, has not happened. And you hear some people have said, I forgive them, I forgive, but I don't forget. Then there's some work that still needs to be done. And so a lot of these uh, past memories or past experiences, uh, things that have happened to them, uh, they've not turned those things loose. You know. uh, the present attitudes that people might have that prevent him or her from uh, growing toward maturity. Uh, and the persons who have certain sort of attitudes, um, um, uh, they are one person uh, in terms of, I felt, I feel that, in a, that prevents that individual from growing toward maturity is that, uh, and I've heard it before, is that what? I don't need to go to the class, what it might be. Um, but I need, I need everything, I have everything I, I have in the Word of God in terms of how to counsel people. Hmm. I see. Uh, the same as putting a gun in the hand of a five-year-old. Hmm. But that attitude is, presenting that per, is preventing that person from moving toward maturity. You know, and you need to study to show yourself approved of work that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. Uh, these are things that we need. God gives us tools uh, that are made available to us uh, to be able to help others. Uh, that's the same as a Christian doctor saying, that, well, for goodness sakes, I don't need any kind of education. Oh. Uh, the word of God I can use to do surgery on garden leaves. Well, if you subject yourself to that doctor, well, <laughs> may God help you so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I would warn you, be aware. But there are certain attitudes that people have that really prevents them from growing toward maturity, spiritual maturity as such. And those are some, some of the things you might want to look at in the process of really counseling with them as such. For the non-believer, such counseling can serve as a kind of pre-evangelism which clears away some of the obstacles to conversion. Uh, and yes, there are some persons who were not, and they have mentioned, you know, well, <laughs> I'm not a spirit in time a Christian, I'm just, you know, learning what it might be. But in all honesty, uh, when these individuals have... Uh, been able to really work I know some of them I've been able to work with and they just look at my attitude and watch my attitude and how I respond to them uh, it gives them something to think about in terms of maybe I might need to check this out uh, you know, and when they really understand how I am like the Holy Spirit within a counseling session to guide instead of me uh, and things start happening uh, it really gives them something to think about. You know, I might need to check this, this situation out here, you know, uh, and see what is what. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, so for the non-believers, sometimes the counseling can serve as a pre-evangelism, uh, which uh, uh, can clear some obstacles to the conversion. Now, according to Collins, evangelism and discipleship, therefore, the Christian counselors ultimate goals, even though they're not the only goals. Now, that's according to Collins. And that sounds okay to me. You know, but David Benner says that the ultimate goal of Christian or pastoral counseling, to put it this way, is spiritual growth or maturity. Uh, Kleindale along the same way. So I don't think they're clashing. It's just a certain way of kind of looking at certain things. It's kind of interesting. Uh, and he goes on to enumerate some of the things here uh, that you might want to follow through in your book. Uh, Self-understanding in terms of some of the goals here in, in working with the counselee to understand self uh, oneself often is the first step in healing you know. and I'm not going to elaborate on this that's, uh, that's why I want you 
each one of you to again uh, do some inner introspection or re reflecting on what it might be in terms of who am I uh, and uh, at many times when persons come to you in terms of uh, counseling uh, they need to come to, to an understanding of who they are uh, not according to how you've been defined by your family system you know? I mean that plays a part you know? not how you've been defined by your your school or your, your other systems whatever it might be uh, uh, but who are you? Uh, you can take a look at who you are in terms of as uh, the Word of God defines you uh, uh, but you need to come into an understanding of who you are uh, in terms of before the, the healing can start to take in place that's very important uh, another word that you're going to find batted around quite a bit in, 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 in the counseling interaction is communication that's a big one uh, and, uh, and Colin just used one example of many marriages marriage breakdown due to problem in communication and uh, my deal my um, advice to you is that when persons come to you uh, be it a marital situation or what it might be and say that we have a communication problem uh, you don't want to just accept it, just that you want them to please help me to understand what you mean by having a communication problem would you be more specific give me more a, of a specific example you want them to specify okay uh, well when I start to talk to my husband about the bills or the money problems he gets angry and walks out and slams the door well that's more specific mm -hmm. and so that's what you want to really uh, have happen when persons come to you and it will happen when they say we have a communication problem and you're going to find out that communication is with all of a lot of systems you know, the church or what it might be you're going to find that one of the major issues or problems that can be obstacles in terms of having good or healthy relationship even a church how can be that of communication because uh, I heard many persons be their pastors or ministers say well for goodness sakes nobody told me I'm the last to, to, to find out what's going on here uh, and so therefore that was, that's, that's one that's going to pop up uh, um, uh, well it's assumed that a lot of behaviors that we do have are learned behaviors uh, 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 we talk about persons modeling certain things in our family system you know uh, uh, what it might be I've done a lot of work in terms of counseling families when it comes down to young children who are having some issues or problems and I found that uh, many times the, the behaviors that are called uh, uh, not acceptable behaviors that the kid is doing are behaviors that they saw somebody modeling. And you know that kids are, m are mimics, are good mimics. They will mimic a lot of things. You know, and there were two kids that I, um, uh, when I, I wasn't doing it, and went in a counseling position this time, but. Uh, uh, CPS uh, worked for Travis County, Wild, uh, uh, Travis County Child Welfare and two young girls very young that was being severely neglected by the mother and um, and they had when they were taken out of the home because of the neglect and placed in a foster home uh, the foster parents were so uh, 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 shocked by the, the type of language that these girls uh, uh, would, would verbalize. Now, when I was taking them around where it might be, they wouldn't say anything. So I didn't, I didn't think that they, they knew how to verbalize anything. Uh, and I would just talk with them in the process of taking them here and there and so forth and so on. And, uh, and, uh, but the foster parents said that these two girls, they can curse like a sergeant. They, uh, they, have, uh, they, they have so much profanity coming out of their mouths 
you know, in terms of cursing. And I was shocked. I said, well, I didn't hear anything. They were all quiet. <laughs> they said, but you know that they must have learned it from that environment as such. So there are behaviors that we do whether we're aware of it or not. You know, many times we're not aware of certain behaviors that end up being learned behaviors that might not be good behaviors for you, might be leading to some bad consequences. So therefore, many times you might have to help that counselee look in terms of uh, learning some new behaviors as such. You know. Uh, and uh, my ideal is that when you become a new creature in Christ, there should be some renewal here, you know, here, and you see the fruits of it, you know, uh, the love, you know, what it might be in your behaviors. And so, therefore, uh, yes, a lot of behaviors are learned. And so, therefore, when some people come to you, there are some learned behaviors that they have that's creating some problems for them and you might need to help them to unlearn uh, some new behaviors as such. Now the word self-actualization is one that I really think that had been borrowed from the psychologist Maslow and some of the other ones as such. You know, um, and as Collins talked here, he says, some writers have stressed the importance of helping individuals learn to achieve and maintain one's optimal potential. Now, I have to look at this one and say, okay, now let's, I'll, I'll just look at it for a second and see what it says here. This is termed self actualization and, and is pro proposed by some counselors as a goal for all human beings, whether or not they are in counseling. For the Christian, a term like Christ actualization might be substituted to indicate that the goal in life is to be complete in Christ, developing one's greatest potential through the power of the Holy Spirit who brings us to spiritual maturity. Now that is coming, coming into the more sort of area here uh, because I truly believe that there are many of us and myself we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Uh, uh, it's it's, it's, it's uh, the Holy Spirit of God working in us to help us move toward that which God wants us to do or to be. You know more and more formed in the image of Christ as such. And, uh, and so, um, it's kind of like um, the situation where some little boys were on a field trip and uh, uh, the people were uh, making uh, the goal and so forth and so on from uh, the dross, what it might be. And one of the little boys asked the teacher, one of the persons, how do you know that all the impurities are out, you know, uh, in terms of this goal. How do you know the impurities are out, are gone? And the man told the boy, when you look into, you look at the attic and you can see your reflection, you know that the impurities are out. And we think in terms of, okay, how about us, even in the counseling situation, in our lives, what it might be, how do we know that a lot of the sin is being worked out, impurities are being worked out. You know, many times when people can see Christ in you. Many times. And so, uh, there is that, you know, when God is finished with us, we'll be like pure gold, like as such, in terms of the refining you know, as such. And so, therefore, it's good many times when somebody might say, well, you know what, I can really see Christ-like, the image of Christ in you. Uh, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Hmm? Or you can see the image in Christ, the image of Christ in someone, you know. Uh, you know that the, the sanctification process is taking place. And, uh, and the same thing in terms of helping uh, your counselee uh, in the process of counseling them. Uh, there's a refining, there's a cleaning out, there's a, you know, what you call a sanctification process going on uh, in terms of their becoming more and more self-actualized, uh, more like Christ as such. 
And so they, these are some, uh, of course, I'm adding my own deal <laughs> from my own work with folks, but uh, uh, that's really interesting. Self-actualization, Christ-actualization. Support. Often people are able to meet the above goals and to function effectively except for temporary periods of unusual stress or crises. These individuals can benefit from a period of support, encouragement, and burden bearing until they are able to remobilize their personal and spiritual resources to meet effectively the problems of living. And that is very important for persons. All of us, many times, are going to run across some situations where really there's a crisis or what it might be, and we're going to need persons to help us. We're going to need support you know, to help us make it through. Bear one another's burdens. You know, uh, uh, comfort one another. Uh, help one another through situations. And so therefore, yes, uh, people who are undergoing stress or crisis, many times are going to need support. You, know, you want to think uh, about it. Uh, think about it. Uh, you know, and we know that, you know, when your soul is anchored in Christ, that uh, God is there. You know. But think about it also, you know, how God works in terms of your having supports when you're going through crisis. You know, we here as a body of believers, you know, we're here to really bear one another burdens, to help one another through these situations as such to comfort one another through these situations. Uh, and that's why it's very important for us to fellowship, uh, to fellowship, so that you can build these supports. Uh, I feel very sad for persons who are not within the body of Christ, uh, or persons who are isolated, uh, who don't have any kind of supports. Um, and I've, I've, I've had those persons in counseling who themselves had uh, turned away from their supports. You know, uh, some persons who've turned away from their, 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 their family systems. They've completely cut away from their family systems. Uh, some persons who feel that I don't need anybody. You know, uh, I can do it myself. Uh, and uh, those individuals that I've uh, counseled having that attitude were most miserable persons. And they had to really come to realization that no, you know, we do need other people. You know, we can't do it by ourselves. You know, and even the reality is that you're going to need, even need somebody to bury you one day. That's the reality. And so therefore, yes, we all need support. And one of the great things in being within the body of Christ and the fellowshipping is that you have persons who can support you or help you through, through, through these crises. And that's the beautiful part. So support is another really very, very, very important element here in terms of the counseling. And um, spiritual wholeness is the last one here in terms of uh, what I'm looking at. And of course, Kleindell, Howard Kleindell, uh, talked about in his book, Pastoral Care and Counseling. That's one of the suggested readings, really. Uh, he always talks about um, uh, spiritual wholeness. Uh, uh, even Collins referred to him in, in his textbook, Howard Kleinbell writes that the heart of pastoral care and counseling is helping people deal with their spiritual needs and find spiritual wholeness. Although talk about religion can sometimes be a counselor's way of hiding personal or psychological problems, the verse uh, is also true. Counselors frequently fail to see or admit that there is a spiritual dimension to all, all human problems. And that's what I basically said earlier. There is a spiritual dimension to all human problems. As a matter of fact, um, uh, he talks about, Collins talks about that many would agree with Carl Jung's often quoted conclusion that among his, his patients who are ever over 30, there has not been one whose problem and the last resort was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. And the latter part of their lives, you know, uh, uh, all of them has looked in terms of finding a religious outlook on their lives. You know, and so therefore, Colin said, the spiritual, uh, the Christian counselor or the pastoral counselor becomes 
uh, a spiritual leader who guides spiritual growth, helps uh, constantly deal with spiritual struggles and enable them to find meaningful beliefs and values. Instead of dialogue between counselor and the counselee, the Christians strive for a trialogue that acknowledges the presence of God at the heart of effective people helping. Mm. And that is so important, a trialogue. Uh, it's not just me and the counselee, but God is in the midst that's helping uh, uh, people who are hurting. Uh, but Collins also goes on to say that counseling is really effective if counselors uh, impose their own goals on clients. It is better if the counselor and counselor work together in setting goals. Such goals should be specific rather than vague, realistic. If there are several organized into some logical sequence that identifies the goals to be worked on first and perhaps for how long. And so therefore that's another uh, one you want to do is get not so much impose your goals on a counselor, on the client or what it might be, counselee, but find from them, you know, what would they like to see happen uh, in terms of the counseling uh, and, uh, and go from there. And my deal in the process of even looking at the, the, the setting of goals, uh, you really want, I would encourage you to really uh, have it as such the person uh, uh, have goals come from the person that they're setting, setting goals that they can accomplish. Uh, goals that can be accomplished. Now I'm going to move on to looking at motivation, diagnosis, intervention, and contracting. And I'm going to look at this in terms from the perspective of some of the things that, that Howard Kleinville talks about in his basic types of pastoral care and counseling. Uh, and uh, Kleinville states that related um, uh, Without forgetting the importance of listening and responding warmly to feelings, there are certain questions to which the counselor needs answers, preferably during the first session. The first session. If these answers are not acquired in the course of the counselor's discussion, the counselor should ask the question directly after the rapport has begun to be established. And now keep this in mind. Again, after rapport has been established. First of all, why did you come for help now. Why did you come why did you come for help now? And why did you come to me? And I do ask that question myself. You know, why do you come and they and let the person explain to me. And why did you why do you, you you come to me? And I, most of the persons who have come to me for counseling have heard from somebody else that come to me for counseling. And so I found in my case, in my situation, that uh, 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 handing out cards or advertising or what it might be didn't work. It you know, was not the effective means of working for me. Uh, the thing that worked the most effectively for me was someone who had been in counseling with me who told somebody else. Uh, and that was good feedback from the person. They said, well, so <laughs> The feedback, so that really works for me. Uh, what is the problem as you see it? As you see it, because I'm just saying, you want to really find out how the uh, counselor, or the counselee, I mean, how the counselee, or the client sees it. Uh, are you hurting, or did you come mainly because of pressure from another? In other words, is the person internally or externally motivated? And this is something you need to really be aware of uh, whether this person is coming uh, on their own uh, uh, hey I need, I need help or are they coming because they're forced to come by some external uh, means. I've had persons a mind you I find it very difficult to uh, uh, making a progress with someone who has been ordered by the court into counseling. I have. Uh, I found it very difficult when a husband has told me, or tell me that I've come to counseling because my wife said if I did not come, uh, uh, she was going to divorce me. Uh, a young person said, I'm here because my parents sent me. 
Uh, a lot of external pressures uh, that these persons, you know, are saying that, hey, they're, they're coming. And you need to know it. Because, in all honesty, uh, that's why a lot of the, um, the, the therapists that I consult, uh, I'm their consultant in terms of certain cases that they have, and, on Wednesdays and Thursdays at an agency, and um, uh, many of the therapists are really plagued with no shows, especially no shows and cancellations. Uh, and uh, they need to understand uh, what are the motivations of the clients that are sent to you, and what is motivating them to come. Uh, is it internal or external? And those persons who are coming because they are forced to come, or have to come, are the ones where they get the most no-shows. But the ones who said, I'm coming because I want to come and I need your help, is the one that you're going to really know that they're going to keep their appointments. Now, if they can't keep them, they're going to call you and say, hey, well, if you have a no-show, start the no-showing on you, then you need to really uh, find out what has what happened here for the person now is no showing on me. Yeah. Also, how do you feel about being here? How do you feel about being here? In the counseling. And it's very important, what kind of help do you expect from me? These are very, these, these questions are crucially important because they have to do with the key issues of the counselor's motivation. Neglecting them often result in failure to establish a healing relationship. Counselees and counselors often bring very different expectations to a counseling relationship. These must be brought out into the open and discussed if a resolution is to occur. Uh, and all these things, uh, these questions are very important in terms of motivation, <clears throat> because if you, uh, if there's not an honesty, uh, uh, genuine honesty established in terms of this counseling session between you and that counseling, uh, then um, it's, uh, it's not going to work too well. It's not going to work too well. Uh, during the first interview, the minister forms a tentative diagnostic impression concerning the nature and depth of the person's problems in living. Now, be careful with this one, okay, in this sense, that uh, in the process of listening, and we talk about uh, uh, of listening, we talk about tentative diagnostic, the minister forms a tentative diagnostic impression concerning the nature and depth of the person's problems in living. This is something that is uh, you are having your hypothesis in your head. These are something that are going through in the process of listening. It's not something that you're blabbing out to the person. Okay. Uh, no, it's something that you are just saying, okay, this is you just, Lord, lead me here, Holy Spirit, lead me here. This is, might be, you're getting a feel. Okay, it's not something that you verbalize to the person, okay? You're not, because you're listening, okay? But you are in a process of listening, uh, 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 making some tentative uh, assessments here, I, I would, I would call it. And, and Kleinbell said, by listening intently, he or she uh, may become aware of patterns in the person's feelings, problems, and relationships. And yes, you're listening because there are certain patterns that you might hear in terms of the person's feelings, the person's problems, or relationships as such. And so, therefore, uh, and again, uh, these may give clues to the degree of underlying inadequacies in that individual's life cycle, personality, and coping resources of which the presenting problems are only the current manifestations. Now, when you hear the word presenting problems, as I've mentioned before, these are the ones that the person at that time is verbalizing. Okay. Uh, they might not necessarily be the problem or problems, but they are the ones that the person is verbalizing. Uh, that is the presenting, what we call the presenting problems. Um, 
it may become evident that the person has reasonably adequate coping skills but had been thrown into a temporary tailspin by a severe crisis or series of crises. If so, short-term crisis counseling may be all that is needed. Or perhaps the counselor's personality is so conflicted and problems so chronic that referral for longer-term therapy is essential. So yes, you've got to listen and pay attention to what it might be, and you kind of ask, you know, how long has it been going on, what has happened in the last, you know, week or so, or the last few months before, and so on, the person started relating to you some things uh, that had happened, well, for goodness sakes, uh, in the last uh, few months, uh, not only uh, uh, have I, my, my mother died, you know, but uh, uh, my, 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 my father has recently gotten diagnosed as having liver cancer, and he's only been, been given a few months to live. And not only that, uh, while my, my father was being, uh, had to undergo uh, surgery, my daughter had to uh, have a uh, surgery done uh, because the spinal fluid was very life-threatening to her, so therefore that was happening. Uh, plus this, and so you're, you're listening. So that is saying that, oh, for goodness sakes, these are some losses and some, you know, potential loss and crisis going here uh, in this person's life. Okay? And so therefore, you, 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 you're, you're hearing that. You know, then you're looking in terms of short-term crisis intervention here uh, in terms of helping this person. You're not particular about uh, going into what happened to you in your childhood. You know, from the age of when you were born. No, no, no. <laughs> you, you're going to deal with these situations here that's coming out, you know, as such. Uh, uh, and, and so, oh, for goodness sake, this one might have been a tailspin and a crisis here. Now, I got to help this person, you know, out of this tailspin, you know, so they can get stabilized and then get back into equi equilibrium here, you know, uh, to be able to cope. And that's your immediate deal, your crisis counseling. Now, there are some persons who might come in uh, your office and uh, they're talking to you, the, the pastor or the Christian counselor, what it might be, and they might be uh, uh, as such. Uh, they're talking to you and you just see that, for goodness sakes, this person is so down and depressed. You know, they're saying that they don't want to live anymore. They're saying that life has no meaning. There's no hope. You know. uh, now, it could be a crisis of depression also, you know. uh, but it might be a, a certain clinical depression you know, that might really need to have someone who of a better expertise and work with this individual and that might have to have some type of uh, medication, in all honesty, to, to help this person. It's been that person who don't believe it, but there might be a need. But that sort of person might have to be a psychiatrist or another sort of deal, hopefully a Christian psychiatrist. Uh, and this might be a more of a long-term you know, work, and I advise pastors, don't get into that kind of counseling. Don't get into that long-term counseling. You need to refer that to someone else. And in that kind of clinical picture, clinical depression it might be, might not be your cup of tea. So you need to get someone who's got the expertise in dealing with that. The issue along a uh, while ago, we probably look at it until when we come down to look at eth ethical issues, is that there was a situation where, in California, where uh, the young man left his parents' church and went to another church, uh, a different denomination. And the parents were, were trying to tell this pastor of the church about severe psychological problems that this that their son, uh, problems the son has got, you know, for many years. And this pastor really uh, uh, gave the care of this young man over to an associate pa uh, minister, you know, uh, and really just didn't take it too seriously, you know. And uh, evidently, the associate minister uh, didn't have the wherewithal to deal with this. And so, therefore, the young man came to this associate minister one day and asked him, you know, is it true that once you're saved, you're, all, you're always saved? 
And the social minister said, yes. And so the young man went and killed himself. And ended up being a major lawsuit that came about in terms of this church. Of course, eventually, you know, the, the church came out, you know, uh, victorious. Oh, but these are the kinds of things that you have to be have heads up on. Uh, uh, and don't really take it very lightly. Because there are some uh, persons who do have personality or are so conflicted uh, in terms of problems that they might uh, be needed to, to refer to someone who's not only got the expertise, uh, but someone who can do some long-term counseling with them. Uh, pastoral diagnosis should include an evaluation of the person's general level of wellness as well as patholo any pathology. Always, I, I like what Kohler focus more on, he focuses more on uh, the wellness of uh, uh, solutions more so than on pathology. Uh, the medical model, model is more of a disease-focused model, a problem-focused model. Uh, but yes, you really want to look in terms of um, should be, uh, um, of what the person, the person's strengths, what are the person's strengths, as well as yes, you'll be hearing in terms of certain weaknesses. But look at the person's strengths, and also Klein Bell said it should also give attention to the health of the person's spiritual life. Uh, the values, priorities, beliefs, spiritual vitality. Uh, and as Paul Prusser observes, our theological value orientation should inform our, our evalu evaluative categories also. After forming a tentative diagnosis, the pastor should ask himself or herself, is this person likely to benefit from the counseling which, uh, with my time training and skills will enable me to provide. we have asked that question, is there some agency or therapist in the community that said to provide the specialized form of help that this person needs? On the basis of considerations such as these, the minister comes to a tentative decision concerning whether to offer continuing short-term crisis counseling, counseling or to refer the person. In some cases, the effectiveness of short-term counseling can be discovered best by attempting it. If no progress is made or the person is regressing after a few sessions, it is wise to make a referral. And my plight many times is very difficult to find uh, other Christian counselors or Christian psychiatrists or, uh, who I can refer persons to at times. Yeah. And so therefore, many of the persons I've found I'm not monitoring it, but I found many persons are uh, going to many of the community mental health agencies uh, around, uh, and uh, and uh, that uh, in of itself is somewhat disturbing for me, you know. Uh, and, I, and that's why I'm happy when I can I see churches having their own pastoral staff of counsel or counselors or counselor to really uh, minister to the needs of some of the, the people who are having problems. And so, uh, but yet, uh, you have to attempt some things and you see whether it's working. If it's not working, then of course, uh, definitely uh, refer. If one decides a short-term counsel is likely to help the individual, one should do more than offer it. One should recommend it by saying, in fact, I believe that it might be helpful for us to work together on these issues for a few sessions. Your situation is very painful and perplexing to you. Our goal will be to discover some constructive ways of handling these problems so that you will not only cope better with them, but gain some strength for handling future problems. How do you feel about getting together three or four times, after which we'll decide whether to continue working together for a few more weeks or perhaps find some specialized help if that is needed? And that is what you really want to uh, uh, put it in, that sort of um, uh, way of, of explaining to the counselee as such. And um, then if the, if the person is resistant to even this recommendation that you made, uh, then you should respect this resistance. And, and it should be discussed openly, and if possible, see if you can work with a person where the re resistance can be reduced. You know, and that's going to take a lot of, not only insight on your part, but when you have the Holy Spirit 
working and guiding and leading, and that's going to be very helpful. And I found that to be very helpful in my counseling, all of the counseling I do, in terms of the Holy Spirit coming in and really giving me assistance here. Uh, and so we're going to uh, continue this uh, in the next sessions in terms of motivation, diagnosis, intervention, and contracting. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to look at some of Klein Bell's uh, comments.